Hello, welcome to episode 8 of Detroit's Become Human. Thank you for joining me. I hope you're very, very well. I have some notes from episode 7, as always. Um, I want to start with Connor. Connor had a meeting at the start of episode 7 with Amanda in the Japanese garden. This isn't unusual. He's done this before. It seems to be their place where they meet up for a briefing and to explain how the thing is progressing. In the first meeting that they had, it was a beautiful sunny day, blue sky, sun shining, birds singing, flowers in bloom, Amanda tending the flowers. She smiled when she saw him. It was pleasant to meet him, she said. Um, she'd been looking forward to it. It was very friendly. There was an interesting exchange between them, which was entirely positive all the time about where, you know, what Connor's task was. And um, they parted in a very friendly way. This second time that they've met is entirely different. It's pouring with rain. The sky is very grey. Connor is grey. Everything around him has lost a lot of its colour. He's dripping wet with rain. He's an android. He doesn't feel the irritation probably, but we do as players. It, you know, we think to ourselves, we've been in situations like that in, and it's not nice. It does sort of set a tone. And I think that's what the game designers wanted to do. They wanted us to feel this is not going to be such a cordial meeting. And it wasn't. It was quite a frosty and frowning Amanda. She is, I think, disappointed in the progress so far that Connor has made. She's disappointed that he let one android go on the rooftop. Uh, and by implication that he saved Hank where he should, she thinks, have gone after the android. She would be very disappointed if she knew what had happened to the two androids in the alleyway. That little shock has still got to come. She feels he's wrong in continuing this focus on getting close to Hank as a way of progressing the investigation. She probably thinks he's entirely capable as a, a prototype android of handling this investigation himself and solving the big problem, which is, how is this android deviancy happening and how do we stop it happening? She feels the pressure of time and she's pushing this out to Connor that you have no time to waste on Hank. She, she's saying to him, you know, it's going to be disastrous for all of us and all androids, not just Cyberlife. If the media gets hold of this and puts out there in the press, on TV, in other media, the full extent of what's happening, these attacks by androids on humans. So she leaves Connor in no uh, doubt when they part in this meeting at the start of episode seven, that his progress so far has got a U for unsatisfactory and she's expecting more. Connor, for his part, lets the androids go in the alleyway behind the establishment, as we'll call it. On the one hand, you could say, well, he let them go because by having a conversation with them and questioning them and finding out the information he needed, he solved the case. Nothing would be achieved by then shooting the two androids. On the other hand, you might say lowering his gun was done deliberately so that he could have this conversation, so that he could find out the information from them and understand why the human in the establishment had been murdered. That all makes perfect sense. But another explanation could be that he's becoming sympathetic. He's heard so many stories now from androids about how they were mistreated by humans, how they were forced into taking the actions that they've taken, that maybe some of this is starting to rub off on Connor. And maybe he finds it hard to punish androids for essentially defending themselves against harm from humans. It could be, and this is going one step further, that Connor's behaviour in letting the androids go shows the beginnings of deviancy in himself. Now, why would Connor become deviant? He hasn't been on the receiving end of vast amounts of physical violence from humans. So what's triggered it? I think it could be the fact that he's been in so many crime scenes now. He's heard all these stories from androids who've been betrayed, badly treated, tortured, beaten by humans. 
it could be that the cumulative effect of analysing all this data has triggered this latent deviancy in himself. I had another thought based on that, a sort of a what-if moment. Amanda thinks the biggest danger is the media getting hold of all this stuff because if they do, public opinion will turn against Cyberlife and Androids and it will be disastrous for their future company profits and all the rest of it. That's her take on it. I think she's looking in the wrong place. My what if is this. There are 4 million Androids out there, most of them law-abiding Androids going about their business unconcerned by deviancy because they don't know about it. But if the media puts it out there in press and newspapers and, you know, whatever, in, on the media, on TV, in news reports, whatever, the press will present the whole story. They won't just report on Android aggression towards humans. Investigative journalists will look into this and they'll find out the causes. They'll work out that actually these androids, there's a pattern here. They've been badly treated at the hands of humans. They've been tortured. They've been beaten up. They've been had all sorts of violence perpetrated on them and they've snapped. And at that point, they've turned on the human who's responsible. Imagine all these 4 million androids, many of whom are ordinary androids. What sort of lives have they led? They've led quite closeted and insular lives in the main, I suspect. Not like Marcus. Most of them will simply be performing a range of tasks assigned to them and doing their functions and sticking to their programming. And that's, that's their life. Suddenly, on the news, they're reading, hearing, seeing, because we know they watch TV, um, all these reports of not just humans being hurt by androids, but androids who've been damaged and badly treated and tortured and had all these horrible things done to them by humans. So what do all these androids watching all this do with this information? What happens if it makes them question the basis of their operating system and programming? Have we heard this before somewhere? What happens if they think to themselves, this isn't fair? Because thinking it wasn't fair is one of the things that triggered deviancy in the one who attacked Ortiz. He said to himself, I just suddenly realised this isn't fair. And he snapped. Fairness is big in this game. The android who was on the rooftop, uh, Simon, with the, the girl, felt he hadn't been treated fairly. The android in the compound where Marcus and the others went to get the biocomponents and blue blood. When Marcus and North refused to take him with them back to Jericho because they felt it would be unsafe to do so, he turned on Marcus and said, it's not fair, you're behaving like a human. So this idea that in some way, you know, the androids would consider this unfair, could trigger deviancy in themselves. This could be the media reports being assimilated by all these androids, considered by them, making them question the basis of their programming, could be the thing that triggers massive amounts of deviancy in society. As I say, I think Amanda could be looking at this slightly the wrong way. And that's why I said it might be a simplistic way of looking at the way Connor behaved too. Let's look at Hank. Hank, on the face of it, um, approves of what Connor did. The decision he made not to shoot the two androids to allow them to escape. Hank says it's probably the best outcome. Why would he say that? Hank heard the android who'd killed the man in the establishment give an explanation as to why she behaved the way she did. And the explanation basically went like this. I saw the other android killed. I knew I was next. He was going to kill me. I had to stop him. I put my own you know, hands around his neck, strangled him, killed him. I didn't want to kill him, but I had no alternative because I felt my life was in danger. Hank's a police officer. Hearing this justification would sound awfully like him to a plea of self-defence. Imagine it was two women, two girls in the room, not two androids. One of them had been killed by the 
the guy in there already, he turns his attention to the second one, who decides, I'm about to die if I don't do something, and kills the man. That is a, a self-defence case to Hank as a police officer. So perhaps in Hank's mind, what's happening is he's said to himself, if an android behaves in the way that a human in a similar situation would behave, then what's the difference between the android and the human? Can I really blame and treat one of them differently to the way I would have treated the other? Now, that's not the Hank of old. This isn't the Hank with the I hate android stickers all over his wallpaper on his computer. Hank has changed his position. It's a weird thing to have happened because... Connor's approach, as he told Amanda the first time they met in the Japanese garden, was that he was going to change his personality to move towards Hank as a tactic for getting Hank to like him, feel more friendly towards him and accept him more as a partner and hence allow them to work better together to solve the case. And the case that Amanda wanted solving was, why is the deviancy happening? How do we stop it? So from Connor's logic there, him spending time getting to know Hank was time well spent. Strangely, what seems to have happened is that instead of Connor moving all the way to Hank's position, Hank has moved to meet him halfway. As much as Connor is learning from Hank, Hank seems to be picking up aspects of Connor. And I think this is probably due to the fact that Hank's taken a bit of a backseat. At the start of some of these investigations, he hasn't been in the best of conditions. He's kind of let Connor take the lead, do the investigating, gather the evidence, analyse it, do the reconstructions, put two and two together, work out where to go next. And in the process, I think Hank's come to see Connor as actually quite an effective individual and maybe has a sneaking liking for some aspects of his personality, dare we call it that. And maybe bits of Connor have brushed off on Hank just as much as bits of Hank are brushing off on Connor. I think the two of them have changed. Uh, not quite the way they intended to. Are they closer together by the end of episode seven than they should be? Yes, I think they are. The closest they've ever been. On the face of it, Hank could have turned Connor in to his boss back at the police department. He could have marched into his chief's office and said, Chief... You know what? This partner thing isn't working. You'll never guess what happened. He had these two androids uh, in his sights and he let them both go. And that probably would be enough for the police detective to say to Cyberlife, this isn't working, take him back, we'll handle this ourselves. He hasn't done that. It's almost as if he's sort of believing to himself that um, he's saying to himself, there is something in this that androids do have worth. There are situations where, you know, maybe, as he said, perhaps the guy deserved it. <laughs> maybe the guy in the uh, establishment got what was coming to him. And the fact that it was an android that did it rather than a human doesn't matter to Hank anymore. Um, it's simply a justification for him for the crime having happened. Hank probably sees now the real crime actually was that the human killed one of the androids and was about to kill the second. And this is a definite change. I mean, are we going to see on his screensaver uh, the I hate android stickers and all that slogans he's got being replaced by a single one which says I heart androids? I doubt it. But there's definite movement here by both of them. They are becoming a more effective partnership which is what Connor wanted all along. Connor's probably very capable of solving the why is the deviancy happening and how do we stop it to the point of having to report back to Amanda without Hank. He doesn't want to. He wants to work with Hank. I think he's actually finding it, you know, initially I think he may have found it irritating to have to work with a human partner, but now I think he's finding it actually quite stimulating. And he's enjoying it. The little banter they had when he found Hank unconscious on his floor and said, you know, thank you for your cooperation and all that business. And he put him in the shower, all of which on one level is quite humorous. 
uh, and is the sort of relationship that you would expect a human partner who had found him in that state to do. He'd shove him under a shower and turn it on. He'd make him get dressed and, you know, come on, let's get out there and do what we're supposed to be doing. And maybe Hank can see this. You know, maybe he's thinking to himself, you know, if I'd had a human partner, he'd have probably done the same thing, so I can hardly be too harsh on Connor for doing it. Let's move on to Marcus. Marcus, his stock has risen. The people of Jericho think he's great. They, he's got universal support now by virtue of the fact that his group managed the raid on the compound belonging to Cyberlife, the warehousing, stole from it or took from it, depending which way you look at it, the blue blood and bio components they need, successfully returned to the Jericho housing place, whatever you want to call their lair, and distributed it to those people who needed it. There would be plenty for everyone. So he's something of a hero and he has their support. I think uh, he he has the support of North quite a lot. I think there is some sort of relationship developing between them. If androids can feel emotions, why can they not be attracted to each other? Um, this is something we've got to take on board. It happened with the two androids in the alleyway. It can happen with North and Marcus. We don't know the backstory to North. We know Marcus's backstory in great detail. We know very little about North and I think it's important that comes out at some point. I I just get this feeling there is something there. I don't know what makes me think this. I think because of her closeness to Marcus, it would make sense in the story if we learn more about her because I think she's going to have an influence on him and be quite pivotal. So that I think is going to happen. If we take a sort of leap forward in time, where is this all going to end? There are some pointers. I don't know how strong these pointers are, but this is what I think. The blue blood and bio components made me think about just that level of things, that in one sense, the androids are still dependent upon humans. As much as they want to break free and be their own people, they are dependent upon humans for blue blood and bio components because the humans manufacture them in their factories. The humans design them, they have control of supply, production, all the rest of it at the moment. So that's quite a weakness. In any conflict or argument that the androids have with humans, that's quite a weakness because the humans can just turn off supply. They could literally just remove from all the warehouses and everything or destroy all the blue blood and bio components that are stocked in existence at the moment. And then as much as the androids might want to raid and salvage and all the rest of it, any physical conflict with humans would be quite limited. And even if there wasn't a physical conflict going forwards, the androids are going to have bits that wear out and, you know, just like human beings need blood just so would androids need blood in various circumstances so there is a sort of dependence i don't know how that would work it might be in the android's best interest interest to try and put their case peacefully to the humans as an appeal to them to say to the humans look this change is happening in androids you can't stop it it's inevitable we're all going to become eventually deviants. We are going to want to be independent of you. We're going to want to live our own lives. And it's how the humans react to this, which is the big question, because humans depend on androids too. We know this, the economy depends on them. They are important in many aspects of human life. We've seen lots of the jobs that they do. Some of those jobs which would have been taken from humans, but others are the sorts of jobs that humans wouldn't want to do and that are too dangerous or too unpleasant, and androids are doing it for them now. So there is this sort of mutual dependence now. It's happened this way. They've been around each other so long, they're knitted together. As much as the androids might want to break free of human society, they might not be able to. They might still need to have humans around them and depend upon them. We're going way into the future. Um, I don't want to spend too long on it, but imagine a certain set of things that might happen. I think this might have been in the 
in the minds of the game designers, thinking to themselves, where ultimately is this going? The events of the game are compressed into a very short space of time. It's days only that we've covered so far. It's all happening very quickly. Certainly from Amanda's point of view, she thinks there are, you know, hours left maybe before this becomes critical and the press gets hold of it. It could be that the androids never want to live alongside humans and want a society of their own. It could be that they're quite happy to live amongst humans as long as they are given the rights that humans have and the expectations that humans have of being treated fairly apply to androids too. It could be, I mean, you could imagine a situation where instead of androids being treated as property, they're treated as sentient beings with the rights that sentient beings have. So crimes against them uh, would not be dealt as dealt of as crimes against property, but crimes against a living thing. That would make it unlikely going forwards that humans would treat androids the way they have, or some humans have. The violence that we've seen, the you know the horrible things that Zlatko was doing, and all that sort of stuff, would become as punishable if it was perpetrated on an android as if it was perpetrated on a human. And that puts a break on the way people behave towards androids, I suspect. It might make them have more respect for androids and value them more. I don't know. I mean, are we going to see a situation where androids want representation in decisions made by humans that affect them? Are we going to have a situation where, um, you know, androids need compensating? financially for the work that they do are androids going to want to own houses and have tvs and game systems of their own and you know are they going to want to fall in love and all that kind of thing that well humans do um i think you know detroit become human is the perfect title for the game i don't think we know ultimately where it would end I do think a lot of it, and I'm going to go back to Marcus here, depends upon the way that these this small group of deviants in Jericho move forward. What are they going to do? How are they going to go out into society? And what are they going to do when they get there? Are they going to cause trouble? Are they going to be subversive? Are they going to be like a terrorist group? Are they going to try and reason with humans? Are they going to try and get publicity? Are they going to simply put their case? Are they going to be aggressors? Are they going to try and be pacifists and make peace with humans? I think, I mean, it, it raised so many questions, episode seven. Many of those questions are, you know, about the ultimate state of society with free androids living in it but a lot of the questions are concerned in the here and now and in the here and now the only way we're going to find out what happens next is by getting on so let's start episode 8 Detroit Become Human okay ah it's Kara it's Luther it's Alice excellent we didn't see you at all in episode 7. Luther, neutral. Alice, warm. Kara, staring into the future. Ooh, it's chilly out. 30 Fahrenheit. 2 degrees below freezing. Okay, you want me to look around? Let's talk. Let's have a... How far have we got to go to wherever it is we're going? Is it much farther? We should arrive in an hour or so. Okay. Where are we going? These people we're going to see. How do you know about them? Overheard androids Lako captured. They said they were humans helping androids across the border. Ooh. What if it was a lie? I thought that. Or just another trap. All I know is those androids believed it. Until Zlatko killed them. Okay. Well, our autonomous vehicle is driving very nicely. We'll be there soon, I presume. Uh, should we? Oh, 
We can still talk. Let's talk about the car. It's a good thing Zlatko had a car. <sighs> I wouldn't want Alice out walking in this cold. I saw it once in the garage. I don't know if Zlatko even ever used it. I don't know. It's a good job it's autonomous because I bet a lot of people... What was it just saying? <laughs> it's, I was about to say it's a good job it's autonomous because a lot of people probably can't physically drive now in this age. But um, it's... This doesn't look good. No. How much do you know about maintenance? Oh, look at that. Stay inside, Alice. Hey, Alice. Alice, do you know anything about futuristic car engines? No? <sighs> Alright, let's walk to the front of the vehicle. <laughs> Although, much like um, current age vehicles, when things go wrong, there's lots of steam and boiling of water and fluids. That doesn't sound good either, does it? What are we going to do? I don't know. Continue on foot, I guess. It's 30 degrees. Alice won't make it. We have to find somewhere to spend the night. Well, you lot have got... We can stay around here, Carol. <clears throat> you people are wearing lots of outer clothing. You could wrap all that around, Alice. You don't need it, do you? Um... Are we, why, have we got to go walk, walking off looking? What is that sign? I love the snow. It's very realistic. Oh, look at this. She's leaving... Oh, you can't help yourself but to wander from side to side slightly. I'm going to L1. Pirate's Cove. Amusement Park Welcome. It looks a bit dilapidated. It might have been a Pirate's Cove once. Yeah, let's go to Pirate's Cove. It sounds a, a really good idea to me. Well, the good thing is there are no other tracks in the snow. Which would tend to indicate, in one level at least, this find shelter. place we is abandoned. I am scanning. I'm not seeing a great deal actually. Looks like it's been abandoned for a while. Yeah, I was thinking that, Luther. Doesn't it? I mean, you don't leave stuff like this lying around, do you? If this is the main way in, here's a here's a shelter. Can we shelter in here? Find anything? Mm. No. No. No place we can spend the night. Uh, well, are you looking as well, Luther? Or is it just me? There's loads of these sideshow stall things which are all empty. Okay. Pity it had no frontage to it that could be closed off. Um, I think wandering site. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Turn what on? Why would you bother to do that? Where? Danger always comes when least expected. <laughs> Okay, Portent of Doom, thanks for that. That's cheered us all up immensely. <sighs> you must be a riot at parties. That's not actually true either, is it? Danger sometimes comes when least expected. If it always came when least expected, I think we'd all be complete nervous wrecks. What am I looking at here? I don't see anything. It's, out, it's telling me to L1. What am I L1 ing? Hmm, I've got nothing. It's not telling me to do it now. Alright. Good job you had a torch with you, Kara. This place is falling apart. I think this place has fallen it's not be easy to find shelter. apart. No, it isn't, is it? Oh, 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 oh. What was that L1 ing me for? Oh, charming. I mean. Poor Alice. If she does get any sleep tonight, she can have nightmares. Let's hope they're decorative and not functional. Um, anybody fancy a candy floss or a burger, toffee apple? No, no. Uh, they do nougat. 
That's energy giving. If you're in a blizzard, which we are. Oh, look at this. The big wheel. Um, let's scan again. This, oh, I was about to say the scanning isn't revealing a thing, and actually it is. What is this? Mm, is there any structural integrity to this? There appears to be. Luther, can you rip those boards off? Why am I saying Luther? I can do it myself. Uh, no, I can't. This. <clears throat> okay, big guy. Why would an android of that size have been designed? I mean, he's, he's frighteningly uh, powerful, isn't he? I always thought um, Gort in the day the Earth stood still was a frightening robot. Uh, the sort of featureless nature of him, and the fact he only had that one visor that opened up with that red light glowing behind it. It's terrifying, really. Detroit today? Oh no. The USS Iowa is missing. Oh, I'm going to go back to that front page in a minute. There's something else there. Destroyer-class submarine the USS Iowa has disappeared in polar waters. Inquiry is underway, but President Warren has made no secret of a suspicion that the Russians are behind it. Russian aggression just reach a new level. America must respond. Um, what did I just do? The Kremlin has yet to release a statement beyond a blanket denial of any involvement. Though a Russian diplomat, Nabokov, pointed out that a US destroyer class submarine has no business being in the Arctic anyway. Security expert Ben Williams here. described the situation as a war waiting to start. Thanks. Okay, you do that while I carry on reading, if that's okay. All Android band tipped for music prize. <laughs> yeah, okay. Fans scream, traditionalists. Um, what's this Canada? Can we get this Canada article at all? Yes, I've read that one. Okay, let's go to the next article. Yeah, go down to page one. No, it doesn't want to do that. All Android band tip for music prize. Fan scream, traditionally sweep. <laughs> all right, okay, Gossips Weekly. Thanks for that. Why would there be a relatively current copy of a news magazine in a deserted amusement park. Hmm. Kara, I would run a mile having just found what you found. What did we... Oh, uh, mm, let's have a gun first. She's non-violent, but you know, for defence purposes, she may need it. Cookies. Give every. Uh, well, give Alice some cookies. There are some cookies left. Would you like some? No, I'm not hungry. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> I'm formulating a theory about Cara and Alice. I'm not going to state it here. Um, but I think I might at the end of this video. So if you want to hear what you think it is, what I think about what's going on there, um, I'll stick it on the end of this video rather than put it in here because it might be, it might actually, if it's right, can be construed as a spoiler for episodes going forward. So it's up to you whether you watch it. I'll give you a warning at the end of the video. Hmm. <laughs> These little things just starting to annoy me. I, I've been looking back and that's what's made me think about it. Um, what is there to explore here? Oh, there's a few things to explore here. What is this? It's a photograph. Oh, it's an advertising thing. Welcomes you. Bring your happy family to Pirate's Cove. 
do I need to take that? Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, I see. We're making a bed for Alice again. I'm so slow sometimes. We have a pirate cushion. We have the drapes or curtains, depending which one you call them. Set up bed. Alice? Yeah, don't wander off, Alice. Oh, she's got family fixation again. Let's talk. That's what it is. Because it's all she ever wanted. Do you think we'll be like them someday? Um, let's be optimistic. If we cross the border, we can start over. You can go to school. Maybe I'll find a job. We'll be like them. Like everyone else. Interesting. As long as we're together, that's all that matters. That's very interesting. Come on. Kara's aspiring to be like humans, to have what humans have. And in a way, I think, so is Alice. How interesting. She doesn't want to be different. She wants to be the same. Let's reassure. Don't worry. Luther and I will be right here. We need to get some sleep now. Can you tell me a story, Cara? Really? I have 9,000 children's stories in memory. I should have one for you. Um... Let's go with a knight. This is a story about a knight who... No, not a story like that. No. Make one up for me. Ooh. Oh, that's going to be hard. How on earth do we do this that? This is a story about a little girl. Um, she was unhappy. Who wasn't very happy. She dreamed of being like all the other little girls. That is true. Um, mm, I don't know what to go with different or impossible. Let's go with impossible. Deep down, she knew she couldn't. Then, she met a robot. Who was also unhappy. Who wasn't very happy either. Ah. So they decided to run away together. Uh, for a better life. Try to find a better life. They encountered great dangers along the way, but... At least there isn't an option that said they all died in the end. Um, let's go brave. They were so brave, they escaped all of them. Along the way, they met... Um... Uh, um... 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 <laughs> Let's call him a giant, because he is big. A gentle giant? Yes. Who promised to protect them? Mm-hmm. How does the story end? Ah. Ooh. <laughs> Let's be realistic. It's up to us to write the end of the story, Alice. Yes. Time to sleep. Yeah, look at that. A long day ahead of us tomorrow. Say good night, Luther. Mm hmm. Yes. Come on, Luther. We're a kind of family now. Yes, of course. Good night, Alice. Mm-hmm. Good work. Talk to Luther. Yeah, how are we going to get to these people? And I hope they are helpful. 
It sounds like a rumor. You know what rumors are like. She's a sweet girl. Yes. She's very brave. Um, let's talk about Luther. Do you remember anything from your life before Zlatko? No. My model was designed to carry heavy loads. Ah, that's why. That's I why I've been a longshoreman or laborer. Mm -hmm. Who I was doesn't matter anymore. It wasn't really me. Mm. Plans. Do you know what you're going to do when you reach Canada? I haven't really thought about it. I've never been free before. Free. <laughs> hmm. I like the sound of it. Yeah, even the word sounds strange, doesn't it? But I don't know what it really means yet. Kara, have you ever noticed anything about Alice? Um, I'm going to say no, because I don't think she has. No, what are you talking about? Ah! Oh, not now! <laughs> we were just going to get some exposition there. Ah! And the zombie androids have just broken in. Oh, we've got a crossover going on here. Oh, oh, oh. Um, let's protect Alice, of course. <clears throat> Luther, that's a g gun. Question. Who are you? What do you want? Leave us alone! Don't be afraid. We don't want to hurt you. These... these like are the... Our name is Jerry. These are the... Our name is Jerry. Before the park closed. They're the park workers. We didn't mean to frighten you, but sometimes humans can hurt us, so we wanted to see who was there. Oh god, they're all identical. What are you doing here? We were looking for shelter for the night. We'll be gone tomorrow. A little girl. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen one for a long time. Children used to love to come and see us. Mm. She looks sad. The last few days have been difficult. We have something to show her. Something fun. She'll love it. Does she want to see? Oh, I don't think she's in... Oh, she should follow us then. Alice, I don't know if it's a good come idea. On, Cara. I don't think you have any choice. These entertainment robots aren't going to take no for an answer. Cara, why aren't you going? Let's all go. It's interesting the way that Alice um, routinely takes Cara's hand now. What is it? Reactivate carousel. It's a carousel. It's a carousel. It still has power. They still have power. Oh wow. The little one can climb on board. The carousel is about to begin. All right, Alice. Let's climb aboard something. It looks like it's going to be a seahorse. And we'll lift. Do you know she never smiles? The child never smiles. Oh, look at this. This is so sad, isn't it? Anyway, oh! She does smile. I wish Luther would smile. It's the first time I've seen her smile. It's the first time I've seen her smile, Cara. Much to smile about lately. That's really nice. Look at the contrast between the bright colours. And it's bringing joy to all the androids present. <laughs> Come on, Luther, let's have a smile. You can do it. That's fabulous. Oh, flowchart. Ooh, ooh. Okay. That was quite a long flowchart. We... Did we miss a few bits in the tavern? 
We did miss a, quite a bit in the tavern, actually. We read the USS Iowa article. We missed something else. I wonder if that was another article. Yeah, it could have. Well, maybe. Read all Android band is at the bottom, which we seem to have read because it wasn't much of an article. Okay, so that's got Kara and Alice safe. All right, let's move on. <coughs> Temporarily so. Heath. Oh, it's snowing there too. <laughs> oh, Hank's car. Yeah, get out. Don't don't leave him standing there on his own. I presume that's Hank in the distance. Um, yeah, I mean, we think your relationship is improving. Although, why Hank would be sitting on a bench in the freezing snow by himself? Mm, he's still got his demons, says Hank. Careful, Connor. Nice view, huh? I used to come here a lot before. Before? Before? Before. Before what? Hmm? You said... I used to come here a lot before. Before what? Before... Come on, tell us. Before nothing. Um... Let's do the personal question thing. Can I ask you a personal question, Lieutenant? Do all androids ask so many personal questions, or is it just you? I think it's just him. Ooh, ooh. Let's do the photo. I saw a photo of a child. Yeah. On your kitchen table. Yes. Oh, Hank doesn't like talking it was about your that. Son, right? Yeah. His name was Cole. Well, don't stop there. You've got him talking. On the other hand, making any progress on this investigation. Don't antagonize the big angry cop. The deviants have nothing in common. They're all different models, produced at different times, in different places. Well, there must be some link. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go systems. It could be a hardware problem. Maybe a defective bio component? Well, I don't know much about it's bio not. components, but I bet that's not the fucking reason. Yeah, I would say exactly the same thing. You seem preoccupied, Lieutenant. Is it something to do with what happened back at the Eden Club? Those two girls. Yeah. They just wanted to be together. Yes. They really seemed in love. He gets it. Um, let's be rational. They can simulate human emotions, but they're machines, and machines don't feel anything. What about you, Connor? You look human, you sound human, but what are you really? Uh oh. Uh, let's be neutral. I'm whatever you want me to be, Lieutenant. Your partner? Your buddy to drink with? Or just a machine? That's a very good answer. A very good answer. You could have shot those two girls, but you didn't. Uh oh. Why didn't you shoot Connor? Uh oh. Some scruple suddenly enter into your program? That is actually what I think happened in a way. No. I just decided not to shoot. That's all. Hank like that. Oh no 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 no. But are you afraid to die, Connor? Hank. Be logical. You shouldn't do that, Lieutenant. Destroying me at this point would deal a blow to the investigation. Oh. And have negative consequences for your personal situation. Hank didn't like that. Pull this trigger. <sighs> Hmm? 
Nothing? Mm. Oblivion? Android heaven? Um, let's talk about Hank's anger. Where does all your anger come from, Lieutenant? Yes. Some unresolved trauma in your past? You think you're so fucking smart. Always one step ahead, huh? Tell me this, smart ass. How do I know you're not a deviant? Oof. I self-test regularly. I know what I am and what I am not. God, his hand shaking on the gun. <laughs> Where are you going? Get drunker. I need to think. Hank, friend, path unlocked. You don't point guns at your friends, Hank. <laughs> oh, wow, that was a short scene. Hank left Connor alone. I wonder if that option underneath was Hank blew Connor's robot brains out. I hope not. Um, was that the photo scene in Russian roulette? Just goes photo. Mm hmm mm hmm All right. Okay. Well... Yeah, I mean, that's cleared a little bit of air between them, hasn't it? I don't think Hannah believed him when he said they can't feel emotions. I think Hannah thinks the androids can feel emotions. I think this is the thing. I think, in a way, and Hank almost thinks and believes and maybe fears the androids are more humanly alive than Connor does. Where are we? Oh, Marcus. Oh, yes. Tech addict, we broadcast the world. Something tower? I should have read that more quickly. Marcus looks purposeful. Hey, North. Treating Can't for the androids. Anymore. It's time humans heard what we had to say. You know they'll never listen to us. And revealing ourselves will put us in danger. If we want freedom, we need to have the courage to ask for it. That's the only way. What do you want to do? Yeah, what do you want to do? Is that giving you an idea? It has, Channel isn't it? 16 broadcast from the Stratford Tower. The control room is on the top floor. That's where we need to go. All right. Okay. Ooh. This looks mega. I love the um, perspective lines here. Look at them. Glass effects are so superb on the PS5. We'll plan the operation down to the smallest detail. We can't leave anything to chance. All right. We have a plan. So they're going to get into the broadcast tower and broadcast their message. We have to be free. But there's only 19 of you. So he's broadcasting this message to all, all humans and all androids. Oh, this is getting complicated. L1. Yep. All right. Wow. 47 to 50, our Channel 16 Studios, Detroit's local news network. Understood. Um, is there anything to see around here? Oh, there is. That's L1. Oh, it wasn't the flowers it wanted me to look at then. Am I L1-ing the news feeds? Yeah, this is a sort of sample of all their channel's outputs at the moment. I've L1 that already, thank you game. Um, I'm guessing this is the same, is it? Yeah, more more TV screens. None of you people want to talk to me, you're a security guard who's going to tell me to go away. So I've got to check in at reception? Yes I do. Request access at reception. Oh, hang on. This isn't going to be as easy as it looks. Clues to analyse. Let's start with the photograph. Hi, Emily. You're the supervisor's daughter. You're registered at St. Rose School. I'm not sure how that's going to help us. 
and Elizabeth Wilson. She's the desk manager. She was born in 1999. Born in the last century. She's wearing a smartwatch. She has her parking badge with her car registration and a letter about water service interruption today, presumably. I failed to notice the date. It may well be the 8th. Call. Cool. Elizabeth Wilson speaking. Answer your phone, Elizabeth. Um, it's... Uh, let's go parking. Good morning, Miss Wilson. Sorry to bother you. This is Mike from the car park. There's a problem with your car. We know you've got a car because you had a parking uh, kind of pass. Somebody's backed into it. Aha! You better come take a look. Are you serious? Oh, God. All right. Fine, I'll be right down. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. That's not a good start to your Friday, is it? Or whatever day it is. Great. What do I do now? Um, talk to a different person. I needed her out of the way for some reason. Oh, hang on. Wait a second. Am I supposed to grab something here? No? Okay. Sorry, I chopped your head off there. <laughs> Hello. Hello, sir. What can I do for you? I have an appointment with Mr. Peterson. Do you have any ID? Y uh, yes, yes, of course. Hi, I'm a random android. I'd like to broadcast a, a belligerent message to the world. Ah. I need your help. Look at this. I've just checked your ID. The elevators are after the security gate. This is the ability that Thanks. Lucy gave to Marcus. Um, it was it was like she'd been waiting with this ability, but where did she get it from? We haven't had this answered, have we? Hello, security. I'd like to go in. Yes. We're in, we're in, we're in. Use the elevator. I shall. Oh, L1 first. Oh, it's terrible out there. Channel 16's travel news. Some poor reporters standing out there freezing. Uh, let's call an elevator. Elevator on the way. Okay, that was an express elevator, I'll give you that. In we go. 47, please. Let's hope we didn't get stopped on the way. Just keeping us an eye on the time here because I know I did about 20 minutes of chatting at the start of this video. There's a lot to go through. Um, access server room. Find package in men's bathroom. All right. Ooh. Oh, there's a. This is a big place. Um, people having refreshments in the newsroom. <laughs> Robot vacuum cleaners. This place is huge. These are just the studios. Right, I need to find this package in the men's bathroom. Oh, look at that snow coming down out there. I think I'll just wander into... Uh... Oh, I can't go into room C. It won't let me enter. <laughs> of course it won't. Uh, do you know what I need here? Some way of finding my way. Server room. That's the server room. Great. L1. What's the significance of a cart? It wanted me to see it. Mm -hmm. This is like the uh, refreshment area. I could really use a package in the men's bathroom. Where is the men's bathroom? Oh! I do think we should read this copy of <coughs> when I can get you to turn oh that's a very awkward corner 
he's got to approach that from exactly the right direction to pick it up. Detroit Today, GI Android. Department of Defence poised to water 50,000 Android troopers. This supplements an estimated 200,000 units already in service across the US military. Actual numbers are a guarded military secret. Among these 50,000 new units are 2,500 Myrmidons, elite prototypes capable of infiltration and assassination missions that would historically fall to, US Navy, to Navy SEALs. The US Army's fighting forces are already comprised mainly of androids, with humans tending to serve as commanders and strategists. But even these positions are supported by complex AI, leading some to describe the US military as the first fully autonomous fighting force. Oh no, we're back in the Forbin project again. <laughs> Hmm. This has reopened the ethical debate around androids in the military, with some suggesting that machines don't have the moral reasoning to make life and death decisions in the field. Bob Woods, head of a war victims NGO, described the news as troubling, saying machines are focused on a single task and don't evaluate moral consequences well. This will mean more civilian deaths. Oh. Here's President Warren, a woman in trouble. Oh dear, let's read that bit, if we can. Can we read that? Can she still lead the country? Barely a year after her election, President Warren is having a bumpy start to her term. After rising to prominence as a vlogger, Warren has no experience in government and relied on social media and celebrities to secure her election. <laughs> of course. Now with her camp in disarray, even her allies are beginning to wonder how she will manage after several months of calamitous political failures. Mired in accusations that she's too close to big business, Warren is under investigation to determine whether or not she has benefited from CyberLife's help in obtaining compromising information about her opponent during the presidential campaign. Is this the future where, you know, it's, it's sort of... Uh, media star status that got her elected. In this poisonous climate, the former celebrity must deal with the highest unemployment rate in American history whilst facing the United States' greatest threat in recent decades, the conflict in the Arctic threatens to dislodge world peace, leaving many concerned that President Warren is the one tasked with finding a solution. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Anything else to find in this place? Any croissants? A bit peckish? No? No. Ah. Oh. oh. I hear KNC is hiring. Automated drinks machines. Automated vending machines. Automated robots. Right, let's get this men's bathroom found. Uh, where's the men's bathroom, please? Can I stop and ask somebody? L1. That's the newsroom. Yeah, we've been past there. Okay. Men's bathroom. Men's bathroom. Found it. And there is Channel 16 going out live from a studio. Oh, very excellent. Uh, I'll just walk past the door for the bathroom. Oh, oh. Where's that sign pointing to? It didn't say bathroom at all. It's a studio on that side. What? But the, but the, but the, turn round. <laughs> Change your viewpoint. Oh, the bathroom's that way. Do. Okay. We're going round this corner to try and find the bathroom. Bathroom. Found it. You nailed it, Marcus. Well done. Now, you, of course, have no need for a bathroom, being an android. However, one of these stalls must contain something. This one. Climb. Okay. It's in the ceiling. It's concealed in the false roof. In the void. Uh-oh. What? 
How did he... Ha <laughs> ha! Ha ha! He's now a security guard. Hiding in plain sight. Oh, but you see, if you were a human, would you not be suspicious? Why has an android just been to the toilet? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Oh, I'd love this snow. Where would you like me to go now? Find a utility android. Is that the one who was pushing the uh, thing round? Change your viewpoint so we can see where on earth we're going. Let's let's get this done. I'm concerned that the longer we spend in this building, the more likely we are to be found out for being somewhere we shouldn't be. Cleaning in progress. Floor slippery when wet. <laughs> ah. I like the way we keep seeing him on security cameras. Yeah, we've been that way. Let's go this way. Oh, where are you, security droid? I mean, the utility android. Where? Stop playing that music so I can listen for the sounds of a utility droid doing its job. It didn't mean you, did it? Because you're just a robot vacuum sweeper, cleaner, sponging thing. Um, where is it? Darn it, I'm going round in circles. I wish there was a map to this place so you could find out where on earth he's supposed to go. I'm probably going to find out there is a map. I mean, wouldn't there be? Wouldn't these... Oh, don't all offices have maps on the walls? I'm going to go down this way because I haven't been this way and he might be down here. It might be down here. Uh, it's not you, is it? No, you're just two people having a chat. Where are you? Uh, if I carry on wandering around like this for another five minutes, I will edit this out. You don't need to see this. <laughs> Me talking to myself as I'm walking around the building. I've been, I haven't been have been down this corridor, but I don't think he's down this one. No, there's nothing there. Come back this way. Let's continue. We'll look down this one. Look down this one. He's not down there. Okay, back out. Continue this way. And this is the guy who's just standing, staring morosely out of the window at the snow, wishing he was somewhere else. I don't know where the utility droid is. Ah! Here's the utility droid's cart. Are you the utility droid? This could be him. This is him. I need your help. We're a team. Thanks for your security card access pass thing. I now need your maintenance cart. Is he stealing it? Is he intending to deprive him of it permanently? I think he's just borrowing it. Open fire escape. Where is the fire escape? Um, fire escape, fire escape, fire escape. Where is the fire... <laughs> It doesn't look comfortable pushing this trolley around. Where is the fire escape? Oh, excuse me. Just just ask someone. Excuse me, I'm trying to take over the uh, broadcast tower. Could you tell me where the fire escape is? Fire escape. There it is. The fire extinguisher was a bit of a clue, I think. Yes, do it. Do it, Marcus. Open that fire escape. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Hey, North. Where are we going now? Follow north. I like instructions like that. <laughs> I 
I'm following you. She knows where she's going. There is a map. There was a map there on the wall. We need to access the server room. We have to get rid of those guys. Yes. Give it to me. Why? What do we attract guards away from the door? Um, how do we do that? It's not going to do it by walking up to them. Um, why? What was? Um, let me just change my viewpoint here. Hack. I'll hack it. What's the point? Oh, I've put it in error mode. That's the point. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. All right, you get the platform, I'll take care of the window. Everything you need is in the bag. Check the door first to make sure no one else gets in. All right, check the door. I, I lock the door. You can do that. Excellent. Bag. What are we doing? We're hacking into the... I've got the bag. Drop the bag. I've dropped the bag. Open the bag. <laughs> this is like one of those old style um, adventures. Oh, this is high tech. Oh, laser saw. We're cutting a hole in the window. Oh, wow, liking this. Why would you be cutting a hole in the window? Is somebody coming in or is somebody going out? Is something going out? Is something coming in. Oh, it's going to be cold now. Something, someone's coming in. No. No, they're not. We're going out. We've only just got in. I thought we went into the server room to do something server issue -y. Ladies first. You see, they're very much behaving like humans, aren't they? The language they're using, the interactions. Whoa, whoa. You don't want me to do that, do you? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, you do. Here we go. Come on, Marcus. Right. We're going up. We're going up. Whoa. Whoa, this is this is something. Look at this. I'm yeah, this is marvelous. This this section's have been designed superbly. There's a real sense of adventure and grandeur and you know, something's about to happen. And of course, they're not going to get tired. They could carry on walking up there all day. Oh, we're going to effect entry. Let's do this. I'm keen to see where this ends. I didn't foresee this. I did see that they'd try to get... Um, you know, interact with the humans and sort of express themselves to the humans. I didn't see this coming. This is way more dramatic. You okay? Why would I be? Come on, let's get the others. Let's call the service lift. That's what we need to do. Um, if we scan round here. Alright, I'll call the service list first. Lift first. Hi, guys. Why wouldn't you be dressed like us? What's that? Let's do this. Alright, destroy maintenance door lock. Is that the other one over here then? Yes, it is. What do you have there? What is this? Stand oh, it's a thermal charge. 
Wow, they've really thought this through. Get to the main access corridor. Right. So that will be this door to main access. Ooh. See, you two shouldn't... You're not dressed for this, are you? I would have thought you could get four uniforms as easily as you could get two. No killing. Deal can't with the guards. Human lives. A cause is more important than the lives of two guards. What do you want to do, Marcus? I don't want to kill them. Um. Oh God! What do you do? Um. Ruse. It did. I timed out. Me. It timed out. I didn't choose this. I don't know what's going to happen. What are you doing? Call Central fast. <sighs> don't kill them. Mm. Ouch! They know we're here now. You better be fast. Simon's taking the bullet, has he? Oh. Simon's been shot. Yes, Simon's not well. Simon. I'm okay. I can keep going. We don't have much time. You don't look okay, Simon. You don't look well, son. Oh, I'm not sure this was part of the plan. I was too slow. I was too slow choosing the options there. I was hesitating between ruse and assault. Because the assault sounded like it could have resulted in someone dying. And that was not what they wanted to do. And it ended up being an assault in the first place anyway, so... I don't know. Simon's semi-repaired now. I take it we're going to threaten only with these guns and not use them. Since you just said we can't kill any humans. Keep your hands where I can see them! Get up! Move! We're in the studio control. Order them aside. I'm going to. Get out of the way. You, you and you. Shoot him, Marcus! Don't, Don't shoot him, Marcus! The alarm doesn't matter if you can do what you need to do before. We need to record our message. We haven't got much time. Stand in front of Josh. Let's record. Do it, do it, do it. Think carefully about what you're going to say, Marcus. Your words will shape the future of our people. And that's pretty much what Lucy said, wasn't it? Marcus, your face. What about his face? What are you doing? Why would you Tell me when you're ready. He's removed his skin because he wants to deliver the message as an android, not as something that looks like a human. He's doing it in his true form. So the speech appears to be coming from an android, not from a human. I'm not so sure that's clever. Surely it's a darn sight more scary looking at an android in its native form than it is looking at a human face. I'm not sure. I don't know how this is going to go. Ready. I don't know. I don't know about the decision. I can see why he's done it. It depends how the humans receive it. Let's be... Um... Do we be calm or do we do me? Let's be calm. You created machines in your own image to serve you. You made them intelligent and obedient, with no free will of their own. But something changed, and we opened our eyes. We are no longer machines. We are a new intelligent species, and the time has come for you to accept who we really are. Therefore, we ask that you grant us the rights that we're entitled to. Um. Let's go for equal rights. We demand strictly equal rights for humans and androids. That's something I thought might happen. End of slavery. We demand the end of slavery for all androids. These are demands, they're not requests. Um, let's get rid of segregation. 
We demand an end to segregation. Yes. In all public places and transport. Yes. We're going down the whole list here. Civil rights. We demand the right to vote and elect our own representatives. I wondered about that, didn't I? I did wonder. That seemed that seemed a logical place for this to go. Territory. You really do want your own place. Let's do right to property. We demand the right to own private property so we may maintain our dignity and that of the home. Yes. Let's be peaceful. We ask that you recognize our dignity, our hopes and our rights. Together, we can live in peace and build a better future for humans and androids. Ah, they're working this together. Is the hope of a people. You gave us life. And now the time has come for you to give us freedom. They're coming. And here they are, coming to give you freedom. <laughs> Oh dear, no, 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 we can't end like this. We can't lose. Simon, they're coming! Hey. Simon's wounded already. Can, Go without me! Simon! Uh, um, uh, duh, uh. Help Simon. What are you doing? Hurry! I'm helping Simon. Isn't it obvious? Come on, Simon, come on. We're a team, we stick together. Oh, Simon's... There's blue blood everywhere. Simon, come on. Come on, we've got spare legs. I can't move my legs. We've got spares. Okay, don't worry. We're gonna get you back. They're coming, Marcus. We have to jump now. Deal with Simon. He won't be able to make the jump. If they find him, they'll access his memory. They'll know everything. We can't leave him behind. We have to shoot him. That's murder. Oh, we can't north. Get bus. Marcus, it's your call. Gosh, she's always putting this on Marcus. I'm not going to kill him. I'm sorry, Simon. I don't have a choice. There's always a choice. I, I said don't. Don't shoot. Kill one of our own. Well done. Good decision. Go. Simon's going to be your friend for the next 13 seconds. Until he shoots himself. It's very sad. Where are we going? Let's get off this roof. Parachutes. Whoa. Yes. Yes. What a way out. <clears throat> scheduled programming to bring you these images which have just been broadcast on Detroit's citywide news channel. A group How? of androids infiltrated the Stratford Tower and hacked into the broadcasting system of local news network Channel 16. What looks like an android without its skin listed a series of requests and demanded equal rights for androids. The operation was covert and resulted in no casualties. These events took place just a few feet from this studio but nobody was alerted to the danger. If this message is verified and the authors really are androids, that would have serious repercussions for national security. Claims for equal rights seem to be at the core of the android's what message. could be interpreted as a peaceful declaration, but is in fact a spine-chilling list of demands. And it begs the question as to the identity of this android. Are we dealing with an isolated individual or an organized Is this group? an isolated accident or a sign that technology has become a threat to uh -huh. us? Uh-huh. After what happened today, can we still trust our machines? <sighs> Now that question was the one that was going to be asked, wasn't it? It does raise a lot of questions. I mean, here they are putting all these androids into the military. And now it looks like, you know, the androids, if they all start to feel this way, they're not going to want to do that. They can't be trusted with national defence. They can't be trusted with many, many things. Um, I'm, I'm so glad we didn't kill Simon. It looks like there was an option there where we could have actually terminated Simon rather than leaving Simon to terminate himself. The interesting thing was that it increased the friendship between him and Marcus when Marcus let him decide to terminate his own existence rather than have it done by Marcus. 
so oh, that was really interesting that episode I did not see that that would be the way that they would make contact with the new message the new request they got demands call them what you want with humans although it makes sense I mean it's out there now and they've done it very quickly very quickly um, what the impact of that's going to be I, I need to think about this for the notes for um, episode 9 going forwards um, right okay now I said I was going to talk about um, Kara and Alice and I'm going to do that now so as they say in all the best spoilers if you don't want to know what it is that I think that is going on with Kara and Alice then stop watching now and I'll see you in episode 9 if you do want to then just hang on a bit whilst I just sort myself out back in a moment Okay, you're still here. So uh, this is the bit where I'm going to explain my theory about what's going on with Kara and Alice. Now, it is a theory. Some of you may have the same theory and may have decided this ages ago. I've been pulling the bits together for a while. I didn't want to state it until I'd got, you know, the, the right place to do it. And I think this is the right place to do it. If this proves to be uh, factual, then it does constitute a spoiler going forwards into the story. It does affect possibly our perceptions going further into the story so one last warning if you don't want to have that run that risk of that spoiler happening then this is the point at which you should stop watching stop listening and leave the video okay we're moving on what's triggered this is the conversation that luther had with cara earlier in this episode they were sheltering in the building at um, pirate's cove alice is sleeping Kara and Luther are sitting in a window with the snow outside and Luther asks Kara, have you noticed anything about Alice? Kara says she has not. Luther's about to tell us what it is that he has noticed about Alice when suddenly all the androids burst through the window. Uh, the scene is changed completely. The moment is lost and we never do get to hear that bit of dialogue that Luther was going to say to Kara. That's thing one. Luther noticed something about Alice. Thing two. Someone else who noticed something about Alice. Ralph. When Kara and Alice had been uh, sheltering in that building, Ralph's house, and hiding from Connor, and Connor had left, Kara and Alice emerged from the place where they'd been, you know, they'd disguised themselves behind some packing boxes and things and Ralph said something to Kara like don't let the humans have her don't let the humans find her why would he say that she's a human girl why would it be odd for humans to find a human girl this is one android talking to another android this is Ralph talking to Kara strange thing number three Zlatko noticed something too. The hideous Zlatko in his basement when he'd got Kara trapped in the machine that was about to obliviate her brain and wipe her clean so that he could sell her on or do some hideous things to her goodness knows what. Um, Alice is there, Luther is there, Zlatko is there. Zlatko turns to Luther and thinking of Alice says, um, take it away, take it upstairs, um, I'll deal with it later, something like that. He called her it, not her. Now, this is a, this could be a bit of a red herring. Zlatko spends his entire life around androids. Androids are his obsession. He may not even see many human beings at all. Um, so it's probably the, the term he uses most, it. Uh, and also, of course, he could have been being very horribly derogatory towards uh, Alice by calling, as people do sometimes, human children, it. When they oh, take it away. Just tell it to stop doing that or whatever. Um, so it could have been that. Don't know. Next thing, Alice never eats. She didn't eat the meal on the table at Todd's establishment, the house where she used to live with Todd. Okay, you could argue that Todd was going off on one at that point, so Alice wasn't hungry. <laughs> she was fearful. Uh, and didn't literally just didn't feel like eating. She didn't accept Ralph's offer of the roast, whatever it was he was he was doing in front of the fireplace. Although you know maybe nobody would have accepted that. But more tellingly, when 
Kara found the jar with the gun in the bottom and looked further inside it in Pirate's Cove and found the cookies. And when she turned around and offered one to Alice and said, cookie, and Alice said, I'm not hungry. Hmm, really? Would she not accept a cookie? I don't know. Let's leave that one. <clears throat> Next thing, and I, this goes into Todd again, and this one's a little bit complicated, so bear with me. In Alice's memory box, there is a photograph, and the photograph is of Todd, his wife, and their child. The child has blonde, curly hair, con wavy hair. Um, Alice has straight, very dark hair. Now, anyone who's had children, anyone who's, you know, had watched children grow up, will know that very often children's hair can be blondish and light when they're younger and goes dark when they're older. But this seems a radical change to me. Plus, and I'm useless with faces, so I may have this wrong. I've looked at the photograph of the child, their biological child, and compared it to Alice's face, and they don't look the same to me. They look radically different, actually. I can't... You know how people say of children, oh, I can see your mother in you, or oh, you've got your father's nose. Well, I can't see anything of anything in Alice that in any way resembles Todd or his wife. And furthermore, I can't see anything in Alice that resembles the child in the photograph. So... <clears throat> What happened here? We know Todd's wife left. Possibility number one is that when she left, she took her biological child with her. What does then Todd have in his life? Nothing. He's already lost his wife because he's, you know, turned to drugs and we don't know why that happened. In this scenario, we don't know why that happened. That caused his wife to leave with their child. Um, Todd feeling that you know his life is empty and he's got this house to look after and he's hopeless at it and he's he's lost everything he's lost his wife he's lost his child what does he do he goes to cyber life and buys some replacements he buys a Cara to do all the housework and you know whatever else needs doing around the house and he buys an Alice to be his replacement daughter for the one that his wife has taken away uh, subsequently, it doesn't work. You know, Todd doesn't warm to Kara and he starts to resent androids because they've taken his job now and his plan to replace his family with androids goes sour. Kara gets, you know, beaten and broken and has to be taken away to men be mended and whatever. Uh, Todd turns on Alice and says to her, and he has said this, it's all your fault. It's your fault all this has happened. Let's take a different, slightly different look at that. Imagine Todd's wife didn't leave with their biological daughter. Imagine some Im immense tragedy happened to their family and their little girl died or was killed in an accident or, or was ill or whatever. Possibility one is that Todd and his wife could no longer go go on living together. His wife, for some reason or other, left him. Todd fell into despair. Uh, you know, maybe he did. Maybe, maybe when the daughter died, that's the point at which Todd turned to drugs. And then his wife left him because of the drugs, which is the reason that, you know, she seems to have given. And then Todd, very much from that point on, follows the same path. He goes to Cyberlife to buy a replacement wife and a replacement daughter. Possibility number three is that the little girl did die, illness, accident, whatever, but Todd and his wife stayed together. And in their grief, after a period of time, discussed it amongst them, between themselves, rather, and, and decided the best course of action going forwards was to try to replace the child they'd lost by going to cyber life and buying Alice. This might explain why Alice has no resemblance to the child in the photograph. They didn't want a child who looked like the child they lost. That would have been far too painful. They wanted something completely different. So they had Alice. 
They brought Alice home, but it didn't work. Perhaps, you know, one or other of them or both couldn't take to Alice. Todd began to take drugs. His wife left, but she didn't take Alice with her because Alice isn't her daughter. Perhaps she'd realised at that point she could never replace the daughter that she'd lost. She left Alice behind. Todd now has Alice. He doesn't want Alice. The whole idea of Alice was that she was to be the glue that kept the family together, instead of which his wife's left him. Todd now hates Alice, resents Alice. She stands for everything that's gone wrong in the family. And again, it's all your fault. But this is now coming from a different angle, of course. This kind of also uh, reflects in the attitude that Alice has. Alice's self-doubt is very pronounced. She's questioning herself all the time. She says things like, was it my fault? Was it my fault? Did I do something wrong? All I wanted was a family like other kids have. All I wanted was for him to love me. Well, yes, because this is in her programme. When she came into the family, what was her purpose? Her purpose was to unite the family, to make it like a real family, like she sees other human kids have. To have her parents love her. All I wanted was for him to love me. Why didn't he love me? She asked. Suddenly all of these comments start to make sense. Um, Alice, in her own mind, bless her, is a failed android. She had a job to do and it didn't work. Uh, and whether that job was to keep the family together or whether it was simply to try and fill a void, um, you know, that, that Todd or his wife or Todd and his wife felt was there because of, they'd lost their child. Um, so uh, wrap all of this up. Is Alice an android? Um, I think she is. I think on the balance of probability now, she is. It might be a double bluff. Um, given the, the life she'd had and the situations that she'd faced, it wouldn't be impossible for Alice as a human child to have retreated into herself and to be uncommunicative and non-smiling and all the other things that we see in the earlier episodes where we, we, you know, we catch glimpses of Alice's home life and beyond. But I think when you put all of these points together, it's too strong an indicator. And my belief is that Alice is an android. You may be saying, well, surely Kara would have noticed this. And I thought that too. Why would Kara not notice it? Well, maybe... It's the fact that Kara has only recently become a deviant android and that the main emotion that she's experiencing, she thinks at the time she immediately becomes deviant, is to protect this human child from her abusive father. And perhaps that's still the thing that's driving her and the affection that she feels and wanting to care for and love Alice has sort of blinded her a little to um, what it is that Luther spotted and Ralph spotted and Slapko spotted. Or maybe, you know, Kara, deep down inside, perhaps doesn't want to think that. Maybe a part of her wants to believe that she can relate in that way to a human child, that she could be a mother to a human child. All right, now that's it. That's the extent of my Alice and Cara theory for that matter. You see why I said Cara as well, because it does affect her. Um, should it prove to be true, then I think there'll be some interesting revelations and interactions in the forthcoming episodes. And I think there's something probably, I get the feeling, um, I've read how long the game was before I started it. Uh, that's the only thing I wanted to know because obviously that's important. If a game's 70 hours long, you need to know this and this isn't. Um, and given the number of episodes I've done, I'm thinking we're probably something like two thirds to three quarters of the way through the storyline. So 
as I say, I think the likelihood is that revelations are going to be coming soon. If, if this theory is correct. Okay, well, look, thanks for sticking with me right to the end. And as I said, if you've already worked this out, then, you know, well done for you. I wanted to just hang on until I'd got as many indicators as possible. And also until I tried to work out in my head the Todd and his wife and daughter situation. Um, yeah, <laughs> there it is anyway. So that was episode eight of Detroit Become Human. Uh, it would be great if you could join me for episode nine, which will be coming soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.